Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. Uh, I'm Liv, in case you're new. This is a podcast where I tell you a combination of Greek myths and their entirely troubling treatment of women. Right now I feel it's even more important to focus on the women everywhere and in all contexts. Finally, we're being listened to and believed, and ancient Greece and Greek mythology is a great example where all the bullshit women have had to deal with for centuries and millennia began. So I really appreciate that I have the opportunity to tell you how incredible the ancient Greeks were and how magnificent the myths are, but also to point out the issues, namely just females in general. With that being said, I'm here with this episode and the next episode to tell you how the ancient Greeks believed the world began. This is episode 20, Prometheus and the Other Origin of Species. Now, flashback to the very first episode of this podcast, how the gods came to be, their origin. The Olympians took power, they locked their forefathers, the Titans, in Tartarus, and they went about their lives. But then there was a lull. They got bored. All the drama was gone. There were no fathers to castrate or to lock in the dungeons of the underworld. The world was created, the gods were chilling on Olympus, it was peaceful, and peace is dull. They needed confrontation, wars, drama. And most importantly, there were far too few people to sleep with. Let's be honest, that is Zeus's main concern. It was just boring. And it was boring because there were no humans, just gods and monsters, and who wants that? They needed a little something more. They needed some beings to mess with, to keep themselves entertained. And so when they became entirely over the never-ending boredom that was their godly lives, the gods decided they needed to populate the damn place. They needed people to mess with. They needed people to sleep with. The gods got to work, and it was all of them, too. All the Olympians had a role. They all got to work on the things and creatures that would populate the earth. Each Olympian took a hunk of clay, and they got to molden. They molded all the creatures of Earth out of this clay. Once everyone and everything was molded and ready, they needed someone to equip all the beings with their powers and their characteristics. And there were a few titans who had sided with the gods in the Titanomachy, and so those titans had escaped the fiery chasms of Tartarus. Prometheus had convinced his mother, Themis, to side with the gods, and so he and his twin brother, Epimetheus, and their mother, Themis, had escaped the punishment of the other titans. The gods gave Prometheus the job of doing this, of providing the creatures with their powers. Themis, Prometheus, and Epimetheus were treated as if they were any other Olympian after the Titanomachy. They lived on Olympus and just hung out with the other gods. And Prometheus? Well, Prometheus was super fucking smart. Maybe it's ironic to describe intelligence with lowly curse words, but frankly, I would disagree with my parents on that. I'm a nerdy, smart-ass woman, and I choose to swear. But I digress. Prometheus was fucking smart. He was a thinker, constantly planning and scheming and figuring out the best way to do things. But his brother, well, Epimetheus was not. He was a bit of a dud, a dummy, the opposite of Prometheus, which is not surprising because literally their names mean forethought and afterthought. Epimetheus was screwed from the beginning. So Zeus had been doling out jobs and he gave Prometheus this job of handling the animals, giving them their characteristics. But Epimetheus was jealous. He's a bit petty. And so he bitched to Prometheus that he gets all the good jobs. Epimetheus asked if he could take this job. But Prometheus was hesitant because, well, Epimetheus didn't have a lot of forethought. But Epimetheus made a deal that Prometheus could check his work. Prometheus sighed. He realized this didn't really take any of the responsibility off his shoulders. He'd have to check everything anyway. But whatever, the job could go to Epimetheus if it got him off his back. He would let him have it. (music) 
Epimetheus went to work, and he made some pretty weird choices. He made some animals fast, some strong, some could fly, some could swim, some could jump, some could dig themselves into the earth. If you think about it, animals have some pretty weird characteristics. Kinda like a drunk dude thought, fuck it, let's have some fun. He made it so that some animals stood out. Zebras have stripes, leopards have spots. Some could blend in. There was camouflage or just the colors of areas around them. Some he gave sharp teeth, some sharp claws, some got both. And some got neither. I mean, sloths are a good example of a weirdo coming up with random ideas. Epimetheus made some animals adaptable to the cold, some to the warm. Snakes, he just thought, let's make a scary, squirmy, boneless looking monstrosity. Sharks, he thought, let's make the rulers of the sea, badasses whose only bones are teeth, who can sense basically everything around them, who are beautiful and sleek and super duper fast. Fun fact, I have a thing for sharks. The point is, Epimetheus had some fun when he gave the animals their characteristics, their powers on this earth. Some got lucky, others got screwed. It was a mixed bag. But it was a mixed bag that worked. The animals that got screwed on some things had other aspects that made them survive. There was a harmony in the decisions that Epimetheus had made. Some really weird stuff, some really powerful creatures, but it worked. Everyone ate what they needed to, no one ate what they shouldn't, no one would deplete the planet, no one would fuck shit up. Epimetheus was proud. He looked at what he'd done and he thought, seriously, I'm awesome. Look at all of this. I killed it. Everyone will be so psyched. But, he wondered, would Prometheus agree? He called in his brother, asking him to come check his work. Was it satisfactory? Did he succeed? Prometheus came and took a look, and he was surprised. Sure, there was some weird stuff, but it did work. Everyone worked together, and the world would succeed pretty damn well with all these impressive and sometimes freakish animals. What was with some of these bugs, he asked. But he went with it. It worked. Once he'd inspected everything, he noticed a neglected piece of clay off in the corner. Epimetheus had missed something. Typical, Prometheus thought. Typical. He examined the forgotten piece of clay. It was naked. No fur, no claws, no hooves. It wouldn't be fast or particularly strong. It couldn't live out in the wilderness. It couldn't eat raw food. Seriously, what was the point of this thing? It was useless. It wouldn't contribute anything to the planet. It wouldn't live particularly harmoniously with all the other cool creatures that had already been created. Honestly, what was the point in this thing? But there was a deadline and it was now. They had to do something with this useless lump. Prometheus pointed it out to Epimetheus. What on earth is this? He asked with a questioning look. Do you have plans for this one? Epimetheus made a face that made it pretty clear that no, he didn't have a plan. That's a human, he said. And I kind of forgot about it, actually. Prometheus rolled his eyes. Epimetheus continued. I've used up all the powers that Zeus gave me. There's nothing left to give this thing. Well, Prometheus said, there's nothing we can do about it now. Zeus gave us a deadline and it's up. The Earth needs to be populated, like, right now, so this thing will just have to fend for itself. We'll try to think up something, but for now, this is it. And bam, just like that, the Earth is populated with a gazillion different weird and wonderful creatures, and a very boring and useless thing called a human. Who'd have guessed that we'd end up totally fucking shit up for literally everything else on the planet? You should have smushed that clay right then and there, Prometheus. But he didn't, so now there were humans. But there was only one type of human, and guess what it was? I'm getting ahead of myself. The world was created, and the gods had new toys. And boy, did they have fun with those toys. First, they just watched, like TV. There were all these weird animals doing crazy things eating weird shit, hunting each other, jumping around with their babies and pockets attached to their bodies. Weird shit. Poseidon hung out in the ocean, watching those badass sharks, weird ass rays, skating around. Seahorses, speaking of things with pockets for babies on their bodies. 
squids, octopuses. Seriously, there's so much cool stuff on this earth, we should stop killing everything. But pretty quickly, this became boring. There's only so much planet Earth to watch without marijuana before you get a bit bored. So they had to come up with other fun things to do with these new creations. So they'd send a flood or an earthquake, and then they'd sit with bowls of popcorn and watch the aftermath like a particularly dramatic episode of Grey's Anatomy. And then they'd get bored, so they'd send a famine or some kind of personal problem, and they'd watch again. All the while, Prometheus is trying to come up with something to give humans to make sure they survive. He was a sucker for us humans, just trying to save us. Like surgeons working their asses off to save a serial killer. Misguided or valiant or something. Prometheus really bonded with the humans. He felt like they could be anything. Like they could rival the gods themselves in their brilliance and their malevolence. But right now they were nothing. They were nothing more than the most useless of the animals. Naked, hairless, powerless, just wandering around like zombies. He watched as they evolved, slowly. Finally, they got to the point where they knew they were better off together and that they could huddle in caves to avoid the elements and the animals roaming around. That they could wander in search of food, scavenge for what was available from the earth. Prometheus continued to watch. Again, real sucker. First, he decided to give them a little something of what he had, just as a first step in the right direction of making them into what he knew they could be. So we gave them intelligence, and that was big. Huge, really. It changed everything. Because, of course, intelligence isn't just one thing. With intelligence came speech and language, communication that they didn't have before. The ability to analyze, make decisions, good and bad. With language came a new level of safety and confidence in the world around them. They could live together happily, teaming up against the elements and the predators. But with this intelligence and language came fear and weariness. The men, because, yeah, there were no women at this point, became afraid of things around them, wary of the future and of change of things that could happen, even if maybe those things wouldn't happen. And with that fear and weariness came the need to protect themselves. Now, at this point, the gods weren't even aware of what Prometheus had given the humans. They just thought that this was their ability. Other creatures had strength or camouflage or teeth. The gods thought that humans just had some street smarts. Of course, the gods, in all their maniacal glory, saw the fun in the intelligence of humans. Humans had fear and regret, and the gods knew that they could have fun with this. If humans feared the future, the gods could add additional question marks to that future. What if there's a flood? What if there's an earthquake? What if there's a horde of bloodthirsty somethings that will come down from the hills and eat everyone in sight? What if? The gods made quick work of making humans afraid of them and their power. And with that fear came sacrifice. This was the goal. The gods wanted humans to understand the need for sacrifice. Because that meant the gods could get basically anything they wanted out of the humans. They could sacrifice animals or give the gods some gold. They could sacrifice people if they felt it was necessary. The gods were psyched. They fed off this drama. But of course, the key to sacrifice is the gods knowing what was sacrificed. And that only worked by the fire of a burning sacrifice wafting up to Mount Olympus. They couldn't see everything on Earth. There were limits. And the better the sacrifice, the more smoke it would produce, and the more smoke would waft up to the realm of the gods, and the happier they would be. But see, the humans didn't have fire. So how would they be able to sacrifice to the gods and have the smoke waft up? They needed fire and the gods needed to give it to them. Prometheus, the smarty pants that he was, saw the benefits of fire aside from the sacrificial requirements. Prometheus knew that humans could use fire to cook their food and to protect themselves from predators and to keep themselves warm, to build kilns and forges so that they could make pots and storage containers and weapons. Giving them fire would be exactly what Prometheus had wanted for them. It would give them all the powers that he saw in their future. All the gods agreed that the humans should have fire, mostly because of the whole sacrifice thing. They didn't care much about the perks for the humans, just for themselves. Except Prometheus. He saw what it would do. 
that it would help them evolve and build a civilization, that it would be totally kick-ass for the humans. When the gods were finally going to give the humans fire, they made a whole day out of it. Fire Day. The gods came down from Olympus to Earth. Prometheus was the champion for the humans. He was super psyched about the whole thing. Zeus was there to actually give them fire so that they could get on with that sacrifice. Zeus was thrilled that they would finally have the sacrificial victim, and he emphasized that the key to this was that whatever was sacrificed, it had to be the best bits of the animal that would be given to the gods. The best cuts of meat, the good stuff. So a perfect cow was found, and that would be the first sacrifice. Zeus left it to Prometheus to sort out the dirty details. That wasn't something Zeus wanted to concern himself with. But Prometheus, brilliant as he was, also has a bit of a prankster side. Giggling to himself, he cut up the cow into the good pieces and the bad. He thought he'd play a trick on Zeus, so he took out all the good pieces and he wrapped them up in the cow's stomach so that it looked nasty, like a big old stomach. Then he took out all the bad bits, the skeleton and the ickiness, and he wrapped it in a layer of fat so that it looked appealing. He brought everything to Zeus and he showed him the two pieces so that Zeus could choose what it was that would be sacrificed. Because of the way it all looked, Zeus of course picked the gross bits that were wrapped in fat. From the outside, that really looked like what he wanted, the good stuff. So it was that the nasty bits were what was sacrificed. As a result, Prometheus knew that the humans would get to eat the good stuff, the nutritious stuff, the stuff that was edible. He was a prankster, but he was on the side of helping humans. And so Fire Day happened, the peace was sacrificed, and the smoke wafted up to Mount Olympus, where the gods were waiting patiently, super psyched for their first sacrifice. Zeus was not psyched when the smoke wafted up to the mountain, and they realized that it was actually smoke from the nastiest, ickiest bits of the cow. Well, that's an understatement. Zeus was fucking furious. It's possible that this is the angriest he's ever been in all mythology. He's angrier in this moment than when he accidentally killed many of the women he slept with, or when Hera ruined those women, or when really anything tragic happened at all. This was it. This was the breaking point. Of course, none of those other things had happened yet. I'm ahead of the myths, but still. Zeus was so angry that the only thing he could think to do was to rid the earth of the human race entirely. This is another great example of when the wrong people are blamed for something. It was Prometheus's fault, but Zeus knew that Prometheus felt strongly about the humans, so he knew that this was really the punishment for Prometheus, even if it also meant destroying an entire race that they had basically only just created. But Zeus didn't want to make it quick, with a fire or a flood, or by having his brother Poseidon send an earthquake. No, he wanted the humans to suffer, and suffer bad. So Zeus decided that the best way to do this, the most dramatic way to do this, was to take away the fire that had been so incredibly important to both Prometheus and to the humans who received it. Without fire, they would go back to the Stone Age. No cooking, no heating, no creating, no forging. No nothing. Or nothing that would make them succeed or evolve in any way. They'd be fucked, to put it simply. Zeus knew that this way humans would just die out. It would be slow and dramatic and tragic. The gods could watch as the other more powerful creatures preyed on them until finally they would be gone. Zeus is a dick, if it hasn't been made clear in all the other episodes of this podcast. A vindictive dick. Prometheus, though, wasn't giving up on his people. He was invested in the humans, he really wanted them to succeed, and he wanted to do everything he could to help them. So when things had calmed down a bit and the Olympians were distracted up on Mount Olympus, Prometheus stole away to Hephaestus' forge. He knew that this would be big trouble for him, that he'd be screwed, that he'd be punished horribly by Zeus, but he was invested. He would save them. So he took fire from Hephaestus' forge, and he concealed it in a fennel stalk. I almost left out this detail because I think fennel is disgusting, but whatever, now you guys know. He concealed it in the fennel, and he brought it down from the mountain and to the humans on Earth. It was still Fire Day, and Zeus had decreed that everything that was done on Fire Day was final. That meant that Prometheus bringing back the fire to the humans meant that Zeus couldn't take it away again. That would be it. It would be done. 
Prometheus gave them back the fire, and the men were thrilled. They burned a lot of stuff. They did a fire dance. It was all very exciting. They were safe. They would survive and thrive and evolve. It was a big deal. Of course, finally Zeus found out about what Prometheus had done, and just as Prometheus had predicted, the punishment was not super fun. It was really quite troubling. Hephaestus forged unbreakable chains, and Prometheus was dragged down from Mount Olympus to Earth, to the Caucasus Mountains. And as I told you briefly last week, Prometheus was chained naked to a mountain in a manner so that he could never, ever escape himself, and... From that day on, a massive and very hungry eagle would come to him and peck away at his insides until it broke through, and then it would eat at his insides. And every night, the eagle would fly away, and Prometheus would heal, just in time for the next day when the eagle would return and it would start all over again. This took place for an age. For ever. It had been 30,000 years until finally Heracles arrived and shot and killed that eagle with one of his arrows. And so finally the eagle had been killed and Prometheus was free from that part of his hell, that super gross and ouchy, ouchy part of the hell. But Prometheus was still chained to this mountain, unable to move and unable to free himself. So I mean... Less pain, but still, that had to fucking suck. Time went on, endless, endless time, and finally Prometheus heard that Zeus had developed a thing for the sea goddess Thetis. No one was surprised that Zeus had developed a desire, let's be honest, a one-sided desire for a woman, but Prometheus saw what it could do for him. Prometheus knew that Thetis was destined to bear a son that would be greater than his father. He saw the importance in that. If Zeus were to father that child, then there would be a repeat of Cronus and of Zeus himself, both of whom overthrew their own fathers. He told Zeus that he had information to bargain for, and he used this knowledge to finally gain his freedom. From then on, he wore a garland around his head, It served as remembrance for the chains that he was finally free of. And in the new year, I'll tell you about Thetis and that fateful son. He's pretty famous, to say the absolute least. Well, my friends, this is the time where I need to correct something I've said more than once, and something that I very recently learned was not entirely accurate, and I'm crazy, so I need to correct the record. I was misinformed by the many, many pieces of artwork that depict Atlas seemingly holding the Earth on his shoulders. That is not correct. In fact, Atlas's job was to hold the sky up so that the sky didn't squish the earth, which just makes a lot more sense. And now we all know, we're constantly learning, guys. Just learning. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Let's Talk About Myths, baby! Once again, I'd really appreciate if you would rate and review on iTunes. Um, I've been bumping up in the search results and it's really fun. And I'd really appreciate if, uh, you know, we spread this around a little bit more and The more ratings and reviews, the easier it is to find by other people. You can find me everywhere, as per usual. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's all myths, baby. You know that. It's been a while. Next week, we'll be back to, you know, figure out how women came to be. Because in case you didn't notice there, still no ladies. Just the goddesses at this point. And, uh, Lord knows Zeus needs them women. Thank you all for listening. You're all wonderful. I'm Liv. I, uh, really love this shit. <laughs>